without further ado, welcome to our second session for our repair seminars. Um, we're trying to give you as, as varied a collection of topics as we can. And so today we're gonna take care of some of the most common trumpet questions and repairs that we get. Again, I'm gonna be joined by my amazing colleagues, James Monaghan and Kenny Pyatt, who are in the shop. So what I would suggest is if you want to, feel free to keep your camera on, that's totally fine. Um, mute yourselves just so that we can make sure that we're hearing just the uh just the presenter on the screen whether it's james or kenny and pin the video also so that you can see the largest version um, of what we're presenting so i'm going to turn it over to james um, in just a second but i will just mention that we're going to do a similar format to what we did last time we'll start with uh presenting some of what Kenny's got on his workbench right now, which is related to our, our trumpets. We'll stop in the middle, we'll, we'll take some time for questions, we'll keep on going, and at the end, we'll also leave plenty of room for questions as well. If you have a question, feel free to pop it into the chat. We're gonna keep an eye on that, and if it's something we can easily answer during the seminar, we will do it right there in the chat, and we can also ask it live and be able to talk about it all together as well. Um, so without further ado, James, I'm going to throw it over to you. I'm going to pin your video so that in posterity, people who are watching this after the fact can see your face. So so welcome, everybody. Uh, like Sam said, I'm James Monaghan. I'm the general manager here at Shires. Uh, I'm, I'm here in the, in the shop every day, uh, essentially helping make sure that, that all the craftsmen here are, um, are able to, to make all of the custom instruments that, that we make here. Uh, I'm joined here today with Kenny Pyatt. Uh, Kenny is a fantastic trumpet player uh, and um, runs our repair department here. Um, obviously, primarily, we're a factory making new instruments from scratch, but we also have a, have a good repair facility as well. Um, we service Shire's instruments, both warranty and just, you know, rough and, rough and tumble damage uh, when, when people, you know, need stuff fixed. So we've got a lot of experience. Uh, both making instruments from scratch and repairing them at various times. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Kenny, and he's going to walk us through uh, some common trumpet repairs. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, trust that you can hear me. Uh, I will just be going through some different techniques that we use for uh, any of the repairs that come into the shop, and then also some uh, finaling techniques that we do on our custom and our queue line. Um, so basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to start at the front of the horn at the receiver and kind of go through the length of the instrument and show some techniques uh, that we do for repairs, some tweaking that you can do, some tweaking that we do here. Um, so hopefully this is helpful. Um, I also have a little camera here uh, that I'll be showing some parts of the inside of the horn so you can see what we're doing and what the inside looks like a little bore camera there so um great so let's start right in uh on my peg here i'm gonna move the camera down a little bit so you don't have to look at my ugly mug for any longer than you need to but you can see this gorgeous horn uh i have a q10 uh, silver plated trumpet here. Uh, this is our Q line. It's our professional line of horns here and all of the components are exactly the same as uh, what you're going to find on our custom horns. Um, so there isn't going to be a whole lot different here. This is an unfinaled horn so I won't be <laughs> hopefully won't be doing any damage to this horn but I also won't be doing any damage to uh, our custom instruments here just as a demonstration sort of Point of matter. So, uh, starting on the receiver, a lot of people talk about uh, the gap and how mouthpieces fit into the horn, uh, how they gap. I'm going to show you how to measure gap on the instrument uh, and then sort of what we do to make the receiver fit the mouthpieces a little better. So, I have my calipers here, and what I'm first going to do is take the stem part and put it into the receiver here until it hits the bottom of the lead pipe. And we're just gonna measure that there. So I have about that length. And then if you have a pair of digital calipers, you can zero it out. And that's what I'm gonna do here. 
And then what we can do is put the mouthpiece in. And so we have a Sharpie, any color. Great, and just take a Sharpie and mark right where the mouthpiece hits the end of the receiver there. And then take your zero dot calipers and you can actually measure the bottom of the mouthpiece to where that little line hits there. And you can do this any number of ways just so you're getting the same sort of measurement. Um, what we like to do is an eighth of an inch gap. So we're definitely not at an eighth of an inch there. So we have a number of tools um, to take some metal out of the receiver. This guy here uh, is just a reamer. And I can give you the measurement of the reamer here. Uh, we're at 0 0.350 standard. Uh, I'm gonna jump in here. This is, it's, yeah. a, it's a number one Morris taper reamer that we have shortened uh, from its standard length. So basically a, a number one Morris taper reaper would, would go in too far and, and hit the face of the lead pipe. Right. What we've done is made it so that the Morris taper uh, uh, reamer will stop just short of the face of the lead pipe. So I'm going in here, I'm pretty loose with this reamer. So I know that I need to uh, take a look at the lead pipe and I'm not sure if we're gonna be able to see on the other camera, but I'll show you kind of the face of the lead pipe here on my little mini camera. <laughs> That's a little bright. Let me see if I can take the, trying to move slow so we don't get any seasickness in there. Lead pipe looks pretty flat, but there might be a little bit of solder in there. So what I'm gonna go do is take a little tiny bit of material off the face of the lead pipe or the end of the lead pipe that's happening right here. So we have another reamer that goes down there and I can already feel taking some material off. I'm going to give that a few turns. It's getting down a little further, which is good. So basically I'm just taking some metal off inside the receiver here, inside the face of the lead pipe so that the mouthpiece can go in a little farther. And we're getting a little bit closer. If you can see my little red line, getting a little bit closer there. So that's how we fit. It's gonna take a little bit of time and I don't wanna use up all of our time to check the gap of the lead pipe. But we have a number of reamers and I think if anyone has questions, we can give you the measurements of the reamers that we use to adjust the gap of the mouthpiece. And as I said, the gap, kind of the industry standard is an eighth of an inch gap from uh, the end of the mouthpiece to the face of the lead pipe there. And it really depends on what mouthpiece you're using. Uh, Bach mouthpieces, the taper of the shank is going to be a little bit different shape than GR. GR is going to be a little bit different shape than Shilky. So they're all going to fit differently into the receiver. So depending on what mouthpiece the player is using, depending on uh, what sort of issues they think they're having with uh, the gap or the mouthpiece that can be adjusted one way or the other. So uh, it's not exactly a one size fits all. We fit our receivers to fit with our SE Shires mouthpieces um, to have eighth of an inch gap. Uh, so that's that's what we do to just try and keep things as consistent as possible. Um, yes. Why is why is the gap important? Yeah, um, for trumpets, it's 
it's a it's a big deal um, if the space between the mouthpiece and the lead pipe is larger uh, the instrument is going to play a little bit tighter the slots are going to be a little bit tighter the articulations will get uh, cleaner as the gap shortens um, I think Shilky, for example, likes to have the end of their mouthpiece touch the end of their lead pipe. Um, that will make a little bit freer blow. That will be a little bit more forgiving uh, with the articulations. The slots of the instrument will feel different. A larger gap, the slots will feel a little bit more rigid. The smaller the gap, the slots are going to be a little bit larger. There's a little bit larger target to shoot for um, for the player. So. A happy medium is good, but uh, yeah, the gap can really, really affect how the horn plays and feels. So if you have a customer coming in that says the horn plays tightly, check the gap. The gap might be too large. Um, you know, likewise in the other direction, you can also have an instrument play a little bit more open, freer, a little bit more forgiving by bringing the mouthpiece in a little bit. Point of note, that also affects intonation. So you don't want to go too far one way or the other. But uh, yeah, for trumpet, uh, it's a big deal where the mouthpiece is sitting in the receiver. No. Just one quick question that also came in yeah. from Josh. Um, should, when you're facing the lead pipe, like you were just demonstrating, mm -hmm. should that be done with the tuning slide removed so shavings don't fall into the horn? Absolutely. So this is why I'm doing this on an unfinaled horn so we can clean it up later. But yes, um, good technique for this is to have the horn down, put your reamers in, check things that way. Uh, where'd my mouthpiece go? Bam, check it that way so that nothing gets caught in there. Um, then we like to take a Q-tip with a little bit of alcohol or a little bit of solvent and with the horn facing down, kind of clean this out a little bit then you want to clean the horn afterwards because any sort of shavings can get uh, into the tuning slide, can get into the valve section, and then you have further problems. So that's a great question. Yes, absolutely. One other just quick gap question. I'm just going to ask him since we're on the topic. And stuff. Yeah, yeah, um, please. Go ahead. Yeah, Matt was wondering, uh, will the gap change when you switch to a different mouthpiece? So if, as we trumpet players know, you've got the whole kit caboodle ready to go, how yep. much control do you have and how much consistency is there? Yeah, without question, uh, even mouthpieces within brands can change. Uh, if you have an older uh, vintage mouthpiece, that's one brand, a uh, newer mouthpiece by that same maker won't necessarily gap the same. So um, gap matters, it's a big deal. I don't advise fitting your gap with every new mouthpiece that you buy um, <laughs> because it's, it's going to vary as much as possible. I know there are uh, companies, uh, companies out there that have interchangeable shanks to their mouthpieces that uh, adjust the gapping uh, so you can keep the same rim and cup and be able to change the gap. So there's that option. Uh, but a lot of people like to stick on the same mouthpiece and you can adjust uh, the gap for a single mouthpiece or kind of get a happy medium on your receiver that's going to fit multiple different companies' shanks. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, let's see, moving along down the horn, uh, uh, go into the tuning slide here. Actually, Kenny, there's one yeah. other interesting question. Yes. So AJ is asking, um, so you can use the tapered Morris shank reamer um, to reduce the gap by mm -hmm. making the mouthpiece going farther. How would you increase the gap? Uh, you can correct me on this, James, but I don't believe that there's any great way of increasing the gap other than taking material off the face of the lead pipe. That is, yeah, that's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, and and here at here at Shires, what what we've made is a is a straight flute reamer that is the diameter of the cylindrical section of the mouthpiece receiver. So the the way mouthpiece receivers are typically designed is there's a tapered section that accepts the mouthpiece. And in the gap, it's actually been, been reamed out to be cylindrical um, right before the face of the, of the lead pipe. And we've made uh, a reamer that is that size that will cut on the face of the reamer. 
And what we'll do is we're actually go in um, as straight as we can and um, start cutting the face of the lead pipe backwards um, slightly. Uh, in my in my experience, um, you know, it's it's if you're if you're having to adjust the gap more than you know ten or twenty thousandths of an inch, then then you really at that point maybe better off replacing a receiver or replacing the lead pipe even. You know, um, you can make small gap adjustments, you know, ten or twenty thou. But if you're if you're if you're really going taking a ton of material off, chances are there's there's yeah. a, a defect or something has been damaged. Um, if if you're if you're having to do that to a Shire's trumpet for sure, please contact us because yeah. that's going to be way outside of what we would right. want to have out in the world. All of our customs and all of our cues are adjusted here um, to have that quarter inch gap with our SE Shire's mouthpieces. So. Uh, if it is a stock lead pipe with a stock receiver that hasn't been adjusted, it will be adjusted to that eighth of an inch gap with the industry standard uh, mouthpiece shank taper. All right, uh, if that's it uh, for receivers, I think we can move on to tuning slides. And what you might run into, um, on here is uh, the, the lead pipe not fitting correctly into the outers. Um, so I want to show you a little bit just lapping in a tuning slide a little bit. And um, I'm sure many or most of you have done this. So I may or may not be showing you something that you have done a hundred times. Uh, but this is just the process that we do. Um, if something isn't fitting quite properly, a lot of times we'll lap slides in. And we do the same process for tuning slides and uh, the valve slides. So the tuning slide, we check which leg obviously may not be fitting properly too tight. So what I'm doing is just brushing on a bit of thousand grit compound, non-embedding, so it won't keep lapping once it's done its job. Um, we'll put uh, some honing oil which is just a, a lubricant for the lapping compound, a little bit on there, and gently lap the slide in. This one is fit very nicely. I haven't done anything to this. Um, so just for repair purposes, uh, if you get something that's a little tight, maybe someone bonked the inner of the tuning slide there, you might need to lap it in slightly. Okay, but basically we're just going, working it in with a slight twisting motion. And then once that's moving nicely, the other side, do the same sort of process. Occasionally you might get something that is out of parallel. So you can either unsolder the inner, which we'll do in another, um, in another session, um, but slight, easy, Gentle tweaking is okay, one way or the other, okay? You run the risk of snapping the solder. Um, things should be tight, but if we're a little too wide or a little too narrow, you can go ahead and very, 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 very gently tweak this way or out. Okay? All of our horns are fit. All the cues and customs are fit uh, to be perfectly parallel. So this again is just tweaking if you get a repair in. A note about cleaning off things, which I want to bring up. Um, when you get a horn and you're lapping in the valves or you're lapping in a tuning slide, please feel free to clean however on earth you want to clean these horns. We have ultrasonic tanks here that we use to clean everything. Um, I know some, uh, some shops don't like to use the ultrasonic tanks because um, you run the risk of pulling out some zinc out of the brass. If red rot has started, that's a whole separate issue. Um, you might run the risk of popping a solder if it's loose. Um, my philosophy is if the red rot is bad enough in a horn that the ultrasonic is creating a giant hole in your lead pipe or in your tuning slide, that's something that needs to be addressed separately. If a solder joint is so loose or so, 
uh, unsecure that it's popping off in an ultrasonic tank, that's something that needs to be fixed anyway. Um, so we have industrial ultrasonic tanks here. There's a lot of different grades and strengths of ultrasonic tanks. Please feel free to clean the instrument however you see fit and uh, with whatever strength you're comfortable with. Um, it's just brass, it's just metal, it will hold up to it. Um, we check on all the cues and customs, every seam, every solder joint, uh, every point of contact here um, through four or five different stages of QC. So hopefully we've checked everything, but for repair purposes, if you do have something that's loose uh, or, or pitting, uh, that can be addressed. Um, so what I'm doing to clean off the, right now, just for time, uh, I'm taking one of our solvents uh, that we like to use here. It's called ZEP ID Red. Uh, I like to use this on almost everything because it's safe to use on brass. It's safe to use on silver. It does not strip lacquer. Uh, so for some things, a lot of people like to use lacquer thinner because it, it will cut a lot of the grease and a lot of the grime, but <laughs> in the name, it will take the lacquer right off. I don't like to use it on a lot of the repairs because it is so caustic and so abrasive, but the Zep ID Red is great. It takes everything off and it keeps the finish of everything in its original state. So for our tuning slides, our main tuning slides, uh, what I like to use is we use Hetman grease here. For the tuning slide grease, I like to use something uh, a little bit thicker so the tuning slide stays in place. Uh, what we use for the tuning slides is Hetman 7. That's their thicker of what they offer. Um, so that's tuning slide. Uh, lapping, not a whole lot there other than putting the lapping compound on and getting the tuning slide in and fit. What we do, uh, for our valve slides um, is, let's see, I'll do maybe the first slide for this, is we drop our slides and take the first valve up here. So what we'll do uh, to make sure that the slides, I like my first and third slides to move like a valve. And this one out of the box is pretty darn good. Um, I'm gonna go in a little close here uh, with the camera so you can see what I'm checking for. Uh, the first valve slide should move as smoothly as possible. And I'm gonna switch my camera really quickly. So what I'm showing you hopefully is the ferrule of the lower inner and outer. And I'm just gonna have the slide go all the way up and I'm gonna let it drop. So it's a little hitchy. There we go. As gravity takes its course, as it drops, you see it's not dropping all the way down on its own. And for a well-fit slide, we want it to drop all the way down, okay? So what I'm going to do to drop this slide Back to my big camera is I'm going to take some Zep and I'm going to clean off the inners of the horn and the slide itself. And I'm going to put a little bit of that thousand grit on the slide and on the inner of the horn. I know some people who like their slides to fit a little bit more snugly. Um, as a professional trumpet player, I need my slides to move. And if they're too tight, that doesn't serve me very well um, for adjusting notes. So to get it moving as easily as possible, um, we have our valve slides fit a little bit more loosely. Um, so I can feel as I'm moving this, it's very easy, very easy, very easy. And about 
here, I feel a little bit of a tug. And that is maybe a little bit of solder uh, from when the instrument was assembled. Uh, maybe the, the outer tube is a little tight at the very end. But all I'm doing is just working at a little bit here, and I can feel it. So we'll sit here for a little while and work each, each tuning slide leg right where that point of contact, where that point of resistance is. And it might be 30 seconds, it might be a few minutes. Sometimes we will apply um, more lapping compound if it's particularly difficult. Um, but every single slide will get dropped. So hopefully, um, do, after doing that a little bit, Turn it off and see how we're doing after just those few seconds. Hopefully it's a little bit better. If there's any questions while I'm cleaning this off, I'm happy to try to answer them. Any, um, yes. Uh, Rich Ida is asking, what brand of lapping compound do we use? So our thousand grit is Moco. Yeah. Moco lapping compound. And I know we have garnet lapping compound from Brownells. That's another thousand grit that we'll use. And then our little bit thicker stuff um, from US products. From US products is GK7. So that's what I'll use here on a daily basis, uh, those, those three. We do have others. Uh, that I don't have on the desk right now that is embedding um, that we use a lot of times for our trombone valve pre-fitting. That product's from a Clover. So I'm all cleaned out uh, about as well as I'm going to for right now. So what I'm gonna do is hey, put a little you, valve oil. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Can you, can you explain how, how would you clean the inside of the outer tubes? Absolutely. Um, what you can do is a lot of cleaning kits will just have uh, a little rag handle. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I have one on the desk right here. Uh, but you can just wrap a rag around a little stem, uh, put whatever solvent you like on it, um, Zep for us, and uh, take your your stem and clean it out with the rag that way. So we can do that, or you can, um, sometimes some people will just spray it out that way if you don't care how clean your shop floor is. Um, but yeah, similar to swabbing out a trombone hand slide, uh, any handle, uh, rifle cleaner, anything that will fit inside of the bore. Uh, of the large outer will be fine. Um, only for checking, for handing the instrument back to the customer, I would go through a full clean. Uh, at that point, you know, once we're confident that our instrument is, is fitted properly, we'll take it to our ultrasonic tanks uh, in the other room, make sure the instrument's cleaned out completely, put fresh oil, put fresh grease on, and do it that way. So what I'm doing now to check and see if this valve slide has been properly lapped in is I'm putting on some five star valve oil. And checking it, we're still hanging up a little bit. That might be some lapping compound I haven't gotten out. So I've lapped. So the other problem that you might run into if you're fully cleaned out and you're not dropping completely I'm getting just that last little bit here that I'm not dropping. So the slide might be out of parallel. So what we can do is a little bit of hand adjusting. Taking, and again, very gently, I'm just compressing the two in or out. Sometimes you can see visually uh, where the parallel is. And what I like to do 
is put the slide in on top here first, because you'll get a little bit of a gap on the bottom. So you can see, hopefully, if there's any distance on the bottom or the top, see if there's any gap. That way you can tell if your parallel is off a little bit. I'm going to look here. And I see a little bit of a gap on this side. So I can either adjust the top away, or I can adjust the slide in a little bit. So I'm going to move, I'm going to choose to move the cluster away a little bit. Some very, very, very gentle pressure. Horn feels pretty solid, so I don't think I'm in danger of snapping any solder joint. You don't want to do this too much because you could warp the casing and then you're going to have valve problems, which you don't want. A little bit more compression. Check it. And again, this is something that we may not get 100% perfectly here during this session because it's a delicate process and not often that we final a trumpet uh, inside of an hour. <laughs> so uh, but I just wanted to show you the processes of everything. So still a little tight. So what I would do is just keep going through with maybe a little bit of lapping, a little bit of tweaking, a little bit of lapping, a little bit of tweaking. That's how we drop all of our slides to get them feeling as smooth as possible. We've got a couple of questions coming in too. So James, yeah, I don't know if you want to pitch them or I can. Um, yep. But let's see. Sam was wondering, would you want to check your alignment before you resort to lapping the slide? For us, more often than not, it's a little tiny bit of solder that is still stuck in on the inside of either the slide or the horn itself. Because when they're built, uh, the slides are made perfectly parallel. Um, for our customs, uh, our guy fits every slide to every horn without tension, without pressure. So the slides already come to our trumpet finaler pre-fit. Um, so when we're taking care of cues, when we're taking care of customs, more often than not, I'd say 98% of the time, it's, it's a tiny little bit of solder on the inner inside of the bore. Uh, so it's not usually for us an alignment issue. Okay, cool. And then the other question, um, oh, a couple ones. Uh, sh should we bend the tubes with the piston valve inside the valve casing for safety reasons? Yes, uh, that uh, takes me to a quick thing that I'll show here for the second slide. That's a good practice uh, because the valve acts as a little bit of a support from keeping the casing from warping too badly. If you go too far, it still can warp the casing uh, with the valve inside. But uh, as many of you know, uh, what can happen sometimes is someone will lay their horn down on the valve slides and the second valve slide gets bonked and they'll come in with the valve stuck. What I do, uh, what I did uh, back when I was working as a repair person outside of Shires is first thing I would check and see if gently moving one way or the other, the second valve slide alleviated uh, the valve pressure. Um, so that might be something to watch out for. If it did get bonked, that is your first point uh, to check for for a stuck second valve. Um, but yes, uh, that is a good point. Absolutely, always keep the valve inside the casing. Those I'll let you. Slides. I'll let you keep going, um, and we'll keep an eye on some of the questions and ask them once we get through a few more things. Sure, absolutely. Thanks, Kenny. Um, so that's about it for, uh, for valve slides, um, for common repair things that might happen. Um, what I'd like to do next is check out some valves. 
Um, identifying the problem of a stuck valve is sometimes the hardest thing. What we get as far as repairs here is a sluggish valve. Um, what I do sometimes for a sluggish valve, when a horn comes in here, my valve's grinding, my, my valve's sluggish, um, check and make sure that maybe another valve does or doesn't have the same problem inside the casing. So if it's the third valve that's your problem, maybe take the second valve out and see if it's having the same hanging up problem or the same grinding problem in the third casing. All of our valves are going to be the same diameter. All of our casings are going to be the same diameter, inner diameter. Uh, so the valves will fit and be interchangeable in all of the different casings. So uh, if there is a problem with the casing, you'll know by switching out the valves. If it's a problem with the valve, you'll know by switching out the valves. So identifying the problem that way is your first point of business. Um, most stuff is just a little bit of strange wear and tear, maybe, or uh, the instrument got set down funny. Um, the way that I take care of a lot of those problems is I'll do a little bit of selective lapping. I find for many, many, many repairs, just doing a slight bevel on the bottom of the casing is all we need to free up a grind. So all I'm doing uh, is hopefully giving a little bit more space for the valve to move because you might have a person who's coming at the horn flat fingered and they're causing the valves to canter in a funny way um, instead of coming straight down here. Um, so what I'll do is I'll take the valve and I'll put a little bit of that thousand grit non-embedding on the very bottom half inch or so of the valve. Lubricate it a little bit. And I'll go in from the bottom this way and do a little bit of lapping. Slight twisting motion, slight up and down, no more than an inch on the bottom here. And I wouldn't do this for much more than about 30 seconds. So all you're doing is just giving it that, those few extra microns of space for your player to come in and be able to come into the valves at whatever direction uh, they're playing. So after a few seconds of that, I'll clean. Clean off the valve, I'll clean out the casing that way. I'll oil it, put the valve in, and I'll go at it at all different angles. So let me put the second valve in. And the way I test valves is I'll put my fingers on the pearl itself. I won't move off of it. I'll just kind of go around the edges of it and push in a few different directions. Now, if I feel any grinding or hanging up, I might feel it down at the bottom of the throw. I might feel it at the top of the throw. But I'll go all the way around the pearl and check things that way. If you try, you can get any trumpet valve to stick. It will happen. Um, most, you know, a lot of people who, you know, they really bang on it or they really push to the side and you're only hurting the valve that way. So as you're testing our horns anyway, um, they're fit pretty tightly. Uh, so I just go around the edge of the pearl, put a little bit of lateral pressure one way or the other. And if I'm not feeling any catching, sluggishness, grinding, uh, that valve's probably good to go. Do you have any questions on that process? Or Nothing about the, the valve oh. fitting specifically. Good job. Great. So uh, another problem that you might have with the valves is a gummy feeling. And we um, have had a few horns come in with strange gumminess on the valves. And as far as new horns, uh, this is an opportune problem to pop up. 
some of our horns we will send out to have the Monell nickel plated on our Doc Severinsen models. Uh, all of the valves are nickel plated, nickel plated Monell tubes. And on many horns, on all the dock horns, it's a definite improvement. On some other horns, we uh, like to have it done. Um, what can happen on nickel plated pistons? We have a custom red brass piccolo trumpet here that the valves were nickel plated. Um, When we send them out for nickel plating, the spring barrel gets plated, and we had kind of a weird thing happen where the inside of the spring barrel valve guide channel had a tiny, tiny, tiny little burr from the nickel plating, and it was causing the uh, valve guide to hang a little bit on that channel. So the face of the valve guide here was catching on that very sharp edge of the spring barrel. It was causing it to be gummy. Uh, if your valve isn't grinding, if it isn't sticking, but it still doesn't feel right, it feels like there's a little bit of, the best way I can describe it is gummy feeling. What we'll do is we'll go in, uh, what I found works is going in with a fine file that will fit in the channel here. This way, I'm backwards with my camera. There we go. Fit in the file that way, and I'll sit down and very lightly, very gently. Um, here so you can see. File a little bit in that channel, making sure to. Keep the valve as parallel as possible, as horizontal as possible. And this might take a second, but if you go in, we have uh, these dental tools uh, that you can find on Amazon, any sort of dental pick set. Uh, it's terrifying if you're not using it for trumpet repair purposes, but uh, we find that we can identify burrs inside the bore of the instrument easily. Uh, and then for this, spring barrel channel issue uh, going in and feeling the burrs with this super fine dental pick tip uh, works out really well. So I'll go in with the file it's very very slowly file down and just kind of keep checking because you don't want to go down too far otherwise you're going to interrupt the up and down alignment of the valve in the ports. After I've done the file um, we have these stones, uh, these boride engineering abrasive stones. This is a 600 grit, and it's it's still abrasive, uh, but it's a it's a finishing stone that smooths out metal very nicely. So I'll spend a few minutes also going into the channel that way. And once that burr is removed, you might for for our nickel plated. Pistons. I'll see a little bit of brass showing. So once I get through the nickel plating in that channel there, um, the valve guide actually moves very nicely. So for some horns that you might get in, someone might have been doing something with their valve. Maybe they dropped it while they were cleaning. Maybe something happened and they scored uh, this channel of the spring barrel a little bit and it's causing the valve guide not to move as smoothly as it can in that channel. So check the channels of the spring barrels if you get sort of a weird gummy feeling on the valves and hopefully that will that will take care of it. Any questions before I move on? There have been a few questions in the chat that I've been answering kind of in the background. Okay. Um, one of them that you might want to explain a little more to everyone is um, Aaron asked back to the valve lapping process. Yeah. Um, you showed uh, lapping the valve in kind of the back and forth twisty motion. He's asking, are you worried about uh, cross hatching on the valve by doing it that way? The lapping compound is so fine uh, that I don't 
I haven't run into any adverse reaction to doing it that way. Um, that's for us, I think, just the quickest and most complete way to cover the full surface area of both the valve and the casing. Mm -hmm. Certainly, if you're using a more abrasive compound, uh, if you're using anything with a heavier grit other than 1200 or 1000, certainly. Um, but if you're using a fine enough compound, that's not a problem. If, if the valves are so bad that you really need to use a very aggressive compound, then certainly maybe uh, the full twisting back and forth motion isn't the best. You would want to go straight in. Uh, put the valve in from the top that way um, and only move the valve up and down. That's a possibility. Uh, but for the repairs that we've gotten in uh, and for our finaling processes, we're able to use a fine enough compound where that's not an issue. Yeah, and I can also, I can explain uh, when we're fitting pistons from scratch on a, on a brand new trumpet, we have a, we have a process that's mostly this, this in and out twisty motions, but we always finish our pistons with a straight up and down lap at the very end to blend in all of those, those cross hatchings that we put in um, to give you long, uh, kind of oh, like long striations. So, um, yeah, I can show you a little bit too, um, checking for burrs on the inside of the instrument. Um, if the valves again are feeling a little bizarre, we've tried lapping, we've tried the spring barrel, uh, checking the spring barrel. I'm gonna switch to my inside camera here. There may occasionally be some burrs on the inside of the, of the instrument. And I'm gonna go in with my little, mini camera, I'm gonna turn the light on for you. And so for all of our horns, we check uh, all the casings, all the ports of the casings for burrs. And um, go in. let's take the valve out here. So well, Matt, I'm gonna share with you, this, this camera is something that we buy uh, on eBay. It's a USB dental camera. Um, and we'll we'll share a, a link to it. It's it's they're they're actually not terribly expensive. Uh, I usually get them for around a hundred bucks, um, and we use it every day for things like inspecting the insides of trumpets, and also we do our valve alignment with the camera. It's incredibly accurate. Does a really good, um, you know, uh, very short uh, focal length for looking at stuff up close. It's really it's really slick. So we use this guy. Uh, we check our casings at three different points during finaling um, when the casings are fresh uh, out of the brazing department. Uh, they come to one of the craftsmen and we go in with this camera and check every single port. And then we go in um, with, I'm gonna switch back to my big camera so I can show you the tool that we're using. Uh, we affectionately call it our half moon scraper um, I'm James, maybe you can chime in on what this is, um, but it's a instrument, it's a tool that we use that only the, this half of it is sharpened. So I can go in and take out burrs in some of the ports. James, do you have any more information on this tool? It's something that we've made here. Um, our, our very first ones were, were made by hand out of just a straight crossing file. Um, these have been made on our CNCs out of tool steel. Um, but basically, as Kenny kind of explained, it's, it's essentially a, a half moon shape where it's, it's kind of a flat cutting surface. Um, and we made it the, uh, the same diameter as you know, roughly the same size as, as the bore size of a trumpet. So it allows you to kind of go in and pick out or carve away burrs on the inside of the casing without putting a whole bunch of scratches and gouges in places that you don't want. Right. So we just go in, this horn is actually pretty clean, so I don't have anything to do for you. Um, but you can see sort of what I'm doing. Uh, this is really, really difficult with the camera inverted and me using my non-dominant hand. Uh, but hopefully you can get an idea of what we're doing. Just going in and um, taking burrs out of the ports here. And some of you might uh, have your own setup for doing this, but we just go in and pull as best as we can, all of the burrs out. So I'll use this scraper. 
I'll use uh, any sort of straight blade as well um, if I can get to it with something like this guy. Um, triangular scraper. We have a number of different sizes of inserts for these. Uh, lengthen it, shorten it. Uh, so I'll go in pre-assembly uh, before all of the slides and tubes are fitted onto the horn. I'll go in and scrape out as best as I can all of this uh, before we hone. Get all the burrs out pre-honing. So if an instrument is grinding, the valve is grinding, you get some sort of weird feeling. It might be a burr in the casing. Um, all of the instruments that leave the shop here uh, are, are deburred fully at a few different points during the assembly process, so we take care of that. But something might have gotten into the bore. Uh, you can see it if you have the camera that way. That's a nice way to go in and check different parts of the inside of the instrument. I just shared in the chat a uh, link to the eBay auction for the, the specific camera that we buy. There's a whole bunch of them on there. Some of them don't have as, as narrow of a, a field of focus as, as this particular one. Uh, right now it's 150 bucks on eBay, free shipping. It's a great deal. Also what we'll do on our horns is we will check, um, probably the small camera is gonna be best for that. We'll check the alignment. And I'm just gonna show because it's the easiest thing to do on the camera here. Uh, I'm gonna show you what we're looking for, for the alignment. So what I'm doing is going into the second casing here and I'm depressing the valve and looking here and you can see there's a little gold area. It's the valve, uh, the brass tube of the valve. So this guy is very, very, very slightly out of alignment. I'm depressing the valve all the way down. And so what we'll do for that is we have a number of shims. For all of our customs, we check each valve with the camera and we will shim it. We'll either take down the bumper if it is not going down far enough or if it is going down too far, um, we shim with these guys under the bumper. So we'll take the button off, we'll take the rubber bumper off and we'll insert one of these shims. I think we have a 0.4, a 0.04, a 0.1 and a 0.15 shim. And we adjust the height of the valve uh, up and down vertically uh, with one of these shims. So every custom that leaves the shop has had a valve alignment on it. Sometimes people get the valves, the, the valve caps mixed up when they're cleaning. So if you get a Shire's trumpet in and uh, you're checking the alignment, check and see which shims might be under any of the bumpers. Uh, maybe just by switching them, things will be a little bit more in alignment. Uh, the bumpers that we use do not compress. And especially recently, um, we switched to a little bit harder and a little bit more precise bumper material. So we're finding that less and less that we need to do much of anything for aligning the valves. Um, the bumpers that come with them are just about the perfect height for a vertical valve alignment for our horns, but we still check every single one with the camera and make sure that vertically the valves are aligned. It's a good thing to offer um, and it's a relatively simple thing to do. Uh, Kenny, can I jump in real quick? Absolutely. We, we, so we we have three thicknesses of shim material. Um, these are 4,000 seven inch thick, so 0 0.004, uh, 10,000 seven inch thick, 0 0.01, and 15 thousandths of an inch thick, uh, 0 0.015. Um, just for some comparison, if you guys aren't, aren't totally used to measuring uh, you know, such small inch measurements. Uh, the sheet of paper is roughly six thousandths of an inch thick. So our smallest stem is shim is less than a than the thickness of a standard sheet of paper. James, a question just came in from Joe. Could you use flute shims? Uh, I'm not terribly familiar with flute 
flute shims. Um, we have these made specifically for us. Um, they're incredibly consistent and exactly the right shape for our bumpers. So it's, it's a product that we've, we've had made specifically for this purpose. Um, it really, any shim material is going to work. You can fashion, fashion them out of anything by hand. Um, but that's, that's, you know, our experiences with these, these products that we've, that we've made for ourselves. All right, made for ourselves. I should also note too, just that we have um, a really handy dandy new resource in our parts catalog that we've just completed recently. And I actually added a little portal like click thing for you all to be able to check it out on seshires.com slash repair seminar where you went and originally registered for these sessions. So if you are curious about more of those types of parts, not necessarily the tools and we'll, we'll get back to you all if we're able to start producing tools available for sale to help you with this. Mm -hmm. stuff but the parts themselves are in that parts catalog and then you can reach out to us um, and we can help get through what you need so. uh, Matt has asked how we would align the upstroke on a piston so yes uh, similar fashion um, we have felts here that any spring barrel piston is going to have under the top cap um, we can compress or leave as is this felt here. Um, this is a pretty high density felt uh, that come on our horns. Uh, so we're able to compress it or leave it in its original state, uh, kind of dependent on where the valve is sitting in the instrument. Uh, that's really the only way to align the upstroke. Um, and the felts that we use, it's a good balance of firmness and also kind of cushioning the rebound from the spring. So, but yeah, that's how we align the upstroke. Um, if it is really, really bad, which it shouldn't be, um, you can probably find some sort of shim one way or the other or compress the felt further to get it farther up or farther down. But that's how I would align the upstroke. Yeah, and I can, I can put it here as well. The, uh... You know, one of one of the, the beauties of making the, the Shires trumpets ourselves is we hold all of these 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 components that are that are part of the valve alignment to incredibly high tolerances. So we we check the, the specs on the valve stems, the caps, and everything um, to be perfect, so that everything does click together. Uh, you know, within our, our range of acceptable. Uh, you know. Of, yeah, so I just have these ductile uh, pliers here, and if you have a valve stroke that, if I get my directions correct, that is too far down, you can compress the felt any degree, uh, make it a little bit flatter, put it on, and then you'll have just the upstroke that way. Uh, Matt's asking if the camera fits inside. So I'm thinking, uh, yes, we, the camera does fit inside the valve. Yep. Yeah, to, to an extent, it fits into um, the casings really well. Um, for our trombone hand slide finally, we do have uh, kind of a snake type of setup that goes that's a little bit smaller diameter, and it does go in that way. So sometimes we'll use that uh, if we have particularly difficult place to try to find but uh this this camera here that james may have linked does go uh a wonderful distance into the bottom and the and subsequently the top of the casing so we can see all of the important ports that we're trying to get to mm -hmm. it does not fit into the bore of the instrument only the valve casings now it's also asking, also asking do we move the cap threads the top cap, top cap threads. We do not lube them. Uh, we do lap them so that they move smoothly. We lap uh, if I think the top and the bottom caps. We'll lap them in so it's a smooth but secure um, sort of feeling. Uh, we do not lube them. I don't. I don't think I've ever needed. The top cap to be lubricated. It was never so tight or so gritty that, or, or nothing was ever in danger of getting stuck that we needed to lubricate any of the threads that way. Mm -hmm. 
Sometimes yes. though, what, uh, what you may want to do, uh, a little bit of metallurgy, <laughs> as you know, over time, the galvanization of the aluminum valve stem can wear off. Aluminum and brass are very, very reactive. They're like the two worst metals to put together on a valve. So you may get, you know, very, very old instruments, vintage instruments that come in that have a brass spring barrel of an aluminum valve stem and you take the thing off and the threads have completely disintegrated and they're, and they're gone. So uh, I know some people who do like to for every trumpet that comes in, they like to make sure that the valve stem threads are very clean, the spring barrel threads are very clean, and sometimes putting a little bit of tuning slide grease on those threads can be advisable to kind of preserve the anodization and, and keep things in order and lasting as long as possible, so. Yep. Uh, Alicia is asking if the USB camera plugs into a smartphone or a tablet or a PC. Uh, we've always used the camera with a, with a laptop what Kenny's uh, talking to us from here. Um, uh, we, we have somewhat nice business class laptops in the back of the shop, but um, you know, before that, I, you can actually buy really cheap um, Dell uh, business laptops that are still running Windows XP uh, for under a hundred bucks. Um, we, <laughs> I have a couple of these around the shop because they're basically indestructible and they, they work perfectly well for this, this um, you know, for this, this, uh, this, this application. Um, so you, you know, if you just look for Bell, let's see, what, what is this? Um, Bell Latitude business laptops. They were made, you know, in the early 2000s. They really very rugged for a, for a shop and it'd be a great thing to have for this. You can check their email on it. Kind of. So those are the main topics that I wanted to cover. Um, kind of the big repair components that, that will come in here. It's valves, it's fitting slides, uh, taking care of just a lot of curious mechanical things that might pop up, but. Great. Um, if anybody has any other questions, uh, please feel free to pop it into the chat and we can stay up for a few minutes if, if things are coming through. Um, we're gonna be covering more trumpet topics in Gosh, is it in two weeks? I think it's our last session. Um, so this, the next week is going to be, oops, sorry, I have dogs barking. Next week is gonna be dent work and then approaching solder repairs on trains the following and then solder repairs on trains. So I see something in the chat. Is there a way to prevent red rot? Yes and no. Um, cleaning out the horn as frequently as possible is a wonderful way to prevent red rot. Um, some people's skin, some people's saliva is a little bit more acidic, has a certain pH level that um, causes it very quickly. Um, clean, clean, clean the horn. Brush your teeth before you play. Uh, don't be blowing Big Macs through the bore of your instrument uh, because what, what happens is all of that acidic organic material collects on the inside of the bore and just causes that that corrosion incredibly quickly. Uh, so I would say it's paramount to clean your instrument out as much as possible. Um, I know a lot of people who will put uh, uh, valve oil down the lead pipe of the instrument. Occasionally a grease lubricant or, or something like that can stave off red rod if it's something common that happens to a person's instrument. Um, just keeping the inside of the bore clean or coated, I suppose, can, can prevent that. But over time, corrosion will happen with brass. But, but some instruments, I mean, I've seen 100-year-old, 110-year-old instruments that have absolutely no hint of, of red rod at all. And I've seen instruments that after the first year are showing signs of that corrosion. James, do you have anything to add with that? I mean, part of it is just to understand kind of chemically exactly what red rot is. And it's, you know, it's, it's de-zincification. Brass is an alloy of, of um, copper and zinc primarily. Um, and when exposed to either acidic environments or even extra mechanical stress, 
the um, the zinc can start to leach out of the of the alloy of the brass, leaving behind pure copper. Um, and that is really what the, the red rot is. If you're seeing you know pure copper deposits, um, if it's slight, oftentimes the red rot will will happen on the surface of, of the parts, kind of on the outside. You know, if you've worn the lacquer um, in a kind of a high contact point, or um, you know, there's been a, a lot of kind of acidic you know handling that's worn through the lacquer, and it starts to red rot on the surface. It, it can often just be cosmetic. Um, you know. And if you catch it early and, and keep keep stuff clean, the, the, the parts can last for years, even with, with red rot. I have, you know, my my original Shire's valve section from almost 20 years ago uh, has some red rot on the crooks. And it started to develop about eight years ago. It's still fine. It's still perfectly structurally sound. I poke at it with my finger and it's not any holes. It's fine. You know, in another 10 or 20 years, maybe I'll need to replace those those parts. But um, you know, right now it's just it's just a little bit ugly, which is is fine for me. Um, but that's that's kind of just the thing to kind of be aware of exactly what red rot is. Don't be afraid of it. Just kind of understand what it is and when something does need to be replaced. Uh, Darren is asking, are the repairs we get here at Shires primarily new instruments, or do we do uh, repairs to older stuff or old instruments with problems, like very worn valves or slides. So right now, uh, and probably moving forward, yeah, we only do repairs on Shire's instruments. Um, we have a, a couple trombones that have come in where uh, maybe it'll have, someone will have fit a Shire's axial valve onto a different valve section, like a custom valve section, or we'll have old Thayer valves, original Thayer valves on uh, a valve section with Shire's components. So if there's a Shire's component on the instrument, uh, we're happy to work on that. But yeah, we, we only work on Shire's trombones and trumpets. We leave the rest of it to you all professionals. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. We, we primarily see, I mean, obviously we're going to handle any warranty claims on a new instrument. Um, we would, we would obviously, you know, work on those without hesitation, either repair or replace mm -hmm. uh, once we see those things. We do have, we do have customers that will send their instruments to us when they've damaged it. Um, like even recently in the shop, we've had some trombones that were, um, you know, 15 years old that were coming to us for some repairs and finishing. Um, you know, you've got a trombone that you've had for 15 or 20 years, the lacquer is completely gone, you want it to, you know, look good again. So they'll send it to us for a complete, you know, refinish, refinal, and it comes back looking as close to good as new as, as a 20-year-old trombone can look. Um, so it's a little bit, it's a little bit of everything, brand new stuff and significantly old stuff as well. Cool. Anyone else have any interesting questions or stuff that we didn't didn't cover? The other thing I'll always say is if you do have questions, um, you can always reach out to us. I'm gonna link uh, Kenny's email address here in the chat, repair at sechires.com. You can always reach out to us in general at info at sechires.com as well. I, I'm kind of transitioning that sechires.com slash repair seminar URL to be both a place where you can learn about any upcoming seminars and sessions that we're going to do in the future, because this has been great and we've been really enjoying it. So I'm sure we'll do this throughout, you know, the, the future of the company. Um, but also the, the recordings of the past sessions. So the one from last week is up there and it's on the site and I'll take this recording and I'll put that there on the site as well. So you have that as a resource. Um, so if there are other things that would be beneficial and helpful, send us a note, let us know. We're going to keep building up this this page for you all to be a, a nice little resource moving forward. Cool, James. Do you have anything else on your end? No, I think I think Kenny did a great job covering covering the you know the, the basics. There's a lot to cover on these things, um, and we wanted to give you a uh, just a quick overview of kind of the most common things that we can do. But obviously, if if you have an instrument and, and you want advice or just want to run something by us, please don't hesitate to reach out to contact us. 
um, either by phone. There's a there's a way to get to Kenny directly um, by phone in the back of the shop. His email is repair at suTires.com. Um, we're we're always happy to help. Um, you know any of our dealers and repair techs out there. Um, you know with, with advice, help, training, uh, whatever we can do. So awesome. Uh, we've been sending out little email reminders for the upcoming session, so you'll probably get another one uh, early next week for the next session. But next week is going to be fantastic. It's going to be with Chuck Shepard, who has um, been with the company from the beginning, so now 25 plus years. Um, and he is a magician, an absolute magician when it comes to dent work specifically. I mean, all, all aspects of instrument manufacturing, but to see him work uh, his magic with dent work is really spectacular. So we're gonna do a similar setup to what we did um, today where we'll have a nice little station. It kind of reminds me of like a surgeon gallery. We're just yeah. kind of watching over Kenny's shoulder. Um, so we'll have that. And then the next few sessions, we'll get back to some more like uh, instrument specific repairs with soldering and some different approaches as well. Mm -hmm. So cool. Well, thank you everyone for joining us and keep in touch. Let us know if you have any questions or if we can be of any help. Okay. Thank you, everybody. See you later. Bye.